What's up everybody? This is Travis with Titans of CNC. And today we're going to be doing an overview of a very common, very important inspection item that you will find in the manufacturing environment, the indicator. Now, indicators come in both analog and digital varieties, much like this Digimatic drop indicator that you see here. But today we're gonna to be discussing the former, looking at the dial indicator and the similar, although nonetheless distinct, dial test indicator. Now, both these indicators are similar to other inspection tools in that they are involved in high precision measurement. That is the ability to detect small changes in dimensional attributes. In application, however, the indicator is usually used in what we call comparative or relative measurement. Now, this is a measurement that is usually considering how a feature should be, say a jaw vise being perfectly parallel to your X axis on a machine table to where that feature actually is, say 15 thousandths off parallel. The indicator helps us compare those two surfaces and bring it from where it is to where it should be. Now these relative measurements contrast with what we consider absolute measurements, which are a width or a length, something that you would take with a caliper or a micrometer. So let's take a look at the indicator. From a function and application standpoint, there's really only a few parts of the indicator that you're going to want to be really familiar with. The first is the display. Here you will find most of the information you need to read or interpret your indicator correctly. The most prominent feature of the display is of course the graduated scale that goes around the outside edge. This scale consists of several numbers themselves broken up by graduated lines. Each one of these graduated lines represents a measurement of linear movement as is indicated by the needle or pointer. The value that each one of these lines represents can usually be found somewhere near the indicator. For example, on this indicator you can see a 0 0.0005, which means five ten thousandths of an inch for each graduated line on that scale. Now, there are indicators with even finer deviations, like this one here, that have a 0 0.0001 or one ten thousandth of an inch. This makes this indicator extremely sensitive to even the smallest variations in a part surface. Very helpful if you're looking to make something near perfect. Now, if you are of the metric persuasion, indicators do come in millimeter versions as well, with a very standard deviation being 0 0.01 millimeters. Now, one important difference that we want to note between the dial indicator and the dial test indicator is one of total range. Your typical dial test indicator will come with around 40 thousandths of range for your 0 0.0005 version and around 12 thousandths or so of range for the 0 0.0001 version. Now, your dial indicator, on the other hand, they very typically come with around an inch of travel. With that increase in range, you'll get another smaller dial over here. Each one of those rotations represents one full rotation of the main needle. Now this expanded travel allows for a broader application with the dial indicator. In addition to those relative measurements that we talked about earlier, you may see a dial indicator take larger absolute measurements like let's say travel on a comparator table or maybe even checking feed lengths on a manual machine. Now, one other feature of both indicators that we want to mention is the rotating bezel. This allows us to turn the graduated scale around the indicator, as you can see on both. Doing this allows us to zero out the needle, which makes taking measurements much easier. The other feature of the indicator that you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with is the plunger on the dial indicator and the stylus with its associated contact point on the dial test indicator. Now, as you can see, the plunger moves straight up and down relative to the body of the dial indicator. On the dial test indicator, our stylus though moves in a rotational arc with a pivot point at the end of the body here. Now that we are familiar with the basics of the indicator, let's go ahead and look at their proper use. Indicators need to be mounted in order to be used. And as you can see here, we have several examples. We have a stand here, a height gauge here. If you're out on the shop floor, more often than not, what you're gonna see is an indicator mounted to a magnetic base like the ones here. These allow for reaching various um, difficult to reach locations within the machine. Now, despite this versatility, indicators do need to be used in a very specific manner in order to get accurate readings. If you have ever used them before or been around them, you might have heard the term cosine error. Cosine error is where the reading on your indicator does not match the actual amount of movement in a given feature. Now, fortunately for us, cosine 
cosine error is merely the result of improper technique, and we're gonna go ahead and show you how to identify and reduce or eliminate it right now. So to begin with, we're gonna go ahead and show you the dial indicator. Now I have two gauge blocks here. One is 0.125 and the other is 0.135, a difference of 10 thousandths of an inch. So to start, I'm gonna go ahead and zero out the 0.125 block. Now that we're zeroed, let's go ahead and switch this block out for the 0.135. And as you can see, we've moved 10 thousandths of an inch, the exact difference between those two blocks. Okay, so now we're gonna show you an example of cosine error. To do that, we're gonna go ahead and tilt our indicator. Okay, I'll give you the 1.25 again. And now we will switch this block out for the 0.135 block, again, 10 thousandths higher. Rather, instead of the 10 thousandths distance that we change with that gauge block, you can see we're indicating just over 12. So about a 20% difference in this reading versus when the indicator was straight up and down. That is cosine error. To avoid this air with the dial indicator, you'll want to keep your plunger straight up and down or more accurately perpendicular to the surface that you are indicating. Now we will show an example of cosine air with the dial test indicator. Again, I will use the same two blocks, a 0.125 and a 0.135. As you can see with the dial test indicator, the proper movement is not perpendicular to the surface like with the dial indicator, but rather we wanna be as parallel to the surface as possible. So here we're zeroed out on our 0.125 block, and again, we're gonna switch it out for the 0.135. And as you can see, we've moved 10 thousandths of an inch. And now to show an example of cosine error, we're gonna go ahead and tilt the stylus, much like we did the dial indicator, relative to our surface. Up. Zeroed on our 0.125, we'll switch the blocks out. And so just like with the dial indicator, you can see that when we introduce an angle into the measurement, we get air on the face. This time we had a 10 thousandths difference in linear height, and that is reflected by a 13 thousandths movement on the indicator. Now the reason for cosine air is related to the distance that the plunger on the dial indicator or the stylus on the dial test indicator has to travel when taking its measurement. So going back to our gauge blocks, we have a difference of 0.01 thousandths of an inch. Now, when our indicators are being used correctly, they travel that exact 10 thousandths of an inch. However, as in the case of the dial indicator where our plunger is tilted, the distance that it has to travel to arrive at that same height of 10 thousandths of an inch is longer. Hence, we get the larger reading on the display what we call cosine error. Now, as some of you might be aware, this is best illustrated by trigonometry and the example of a right triangle. Here, we have a leg of the right triangle, our 10 thousandths of actual linear distance, and we have the path traveled by the plunger, which is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. And what describes the relationship between our leg and our hypotenuse? Well, the cosine of that angle, of course. Now, cosine error in the dial test indicator is very similar to the dial indicator, although sometimes it can be a little difficult to imagine the legs of the triangle. Here, you'll have one leg that is illustrated by the ideal travel of the dial test indicator going straight up 0.01, contrasted with when you tilt that indicator, what you have is because this stylus moves in an arc, it swings out this way, which is very similar to a hypotenuse and introduces the same level of air, again, because of that angle in between those two paths of travel. And so again, like with the dial indicator, the more tilt on that stylus that we see, the larger the corresponding angle, and of course, the larger the cosine air. 
Moral of the story, if you want to avoid cosine error, make sure you're using your indicator in a manner that significantly reduces or eliminates it entirely. A couple concluding remarks that we want to cover real quick. Cosine error, while important, is really only a concern if we're recording those absolute measurements. Again, those are measurements that are recording a real value for a real feature. If you're using an indicator for those relative measurements we talked about, this usually isn't so much of a concern as in that situation, and many times we're looking for a zero value or zero indicator movement. There's one more type of error that I do want to discuss that is specific to the dial test indicator, and that involves the length of the stylus that is attached. As you see here, we have a stylus that is about two times as long as the stylus I have down here. Now, these dial test indicators are designed to work with a very specific length stylus. That is because the gearing mechanism inside is engineered to work at a specific arc length. If you take this longer stylus and you put it on this indicator, you will introduce air into your readings. So if you want to avoid that, only use the stylus that is designed for that indicator, or at least be prepared to recognize it and compensate for it. Now, if you do happen to be using a new Mitutoyo dial test indicator, the length of the stylus that it is designed to use is conveniently located on the face of the display. So that covers how to use your indicator properly, but where do you use the indicator? As mentioned earlier, you will find indicators in use throughout a manufacturing environment. You will find them out on the floor in fixture installation, like with the vice example we talked earlier. You might find people trying to indicate parts in a lathe from op one to op two. Maybe they're indicating some raw stock in a four jaw chuck. You'll see them in use in here or also out there checking GD and T, whether it be flatness, parallelism, or perpendicular particularity, and that is to name just a few of its potential uses. Due to its prevalence in a shop environment, you would do well to understand the indicator and its role in manufacturing. Now, because the indicator is a high precision measuring instrument, you're gonna wanna go ahead and take really good care of it. Make sure you don't drop it or bang it into things, and please keep it free of dirt, oil, grime, coolant, and other contaminants. So that wraps up our overview of the indicator. We wanna go ahead and thank you for joining us today. We hope that you've learned something that you can take and help you manufacture better. And also we wanted to note if you're interested in some of these indicators, you can go to our store where you can purchase them. Or if you don't find them there, head on over to Mitsutoyo where you can find a large selection of high precision measuring instruments. Again, this is Travis. We'll see you next time.